Hi, everyone. I'm Wilder Lopez. Uh, I'll be talking today about uh, how geometric algebra can improve two different applications I've worked in the past, especially adaptive filters and neural networks. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organization of the event, especially David. I've been talking to David since like, I think December 2020, when we first spoke about this. And uh, yeah, it has been a real pleasure to be here interacting with you all. All right, so to tell about this, I'm going to uh, give you an overview about my, my background. So today, we, uh, I'm going to show you how I got into geometric algebra, especially trying to apply that to linear estimation. And then I will dig deeper into uh, what I call the geometric algebra adaptive filters, which is the title of my PhD dissertation that I defended in 2016. And then after that, how I changed gears and went into neural networks. Uh, and at the very end, I'm gonna show you a industrial application, like a real life application, how geometric algebra solved the problem of a big car manufacturer. So here we go. So that's a little bit of my background. Sorry about, I think there is some mismatch when we downloaded the, the PPT, but that's not a problem. So I defended my PhD in 2016, and I did this both at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and the Technical University in Munich. And I was working a lot with robotics. My my interest was like how to teach a robot to understand the 3D world and navigate that using vision. Uh, I'll be talking more about this. And then when I defended my PhD, I went uh, straight into the industry. I was uh, hired by a company called Thales in France as part of a European project where I, was, I continued to apply signal processing and machine learning and, and, and different things, but still like trying to find a way to put GA into that. Um, since I wasn't successful doing this in other people's companies, I started my own company in 2018 that was called Abstride. It was completely based on the premise that you could use geometric algebra to improve the performance of neural networks. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the product that we developed there. Uh, yeah, we ended up being acquired last year. And I'm currently uh, kind of juggling between two things. I have my own consulting company back in Paris, uh, which I used to work with several different clients. And I'm also uh, collaborating with a company called GraphStacks that's based in San Francisco and in Washington, DC. And they're working with uh, machine learning applied to graphs. And very soon, we're going to be uh, adding GA into the mix. So here's how everything started for me. Back in my PhD years, I was everything for me was about linear estimation. So what I want to do was to minimize uh, this standards, standard least squares problem. So if, you, if I have uh, these quantities, D and D hat, I would like to find the best D hat to minimize this uh, function. So this is very, very simple. This is the basics for almost everything in signal processing. But the main question that I posed was like, what if those become multi-vectors? What can I do if those become multi-vectors? And especially in the context of uh, adaptive filters. Because in signal processing, as you know, those who work with signal processing, people there are completely comfortable with complex numbers and quaternions. That's kind of dominated. That's not a problem. The problem is they, when they move from real to complex to quaternions, it's as if they are doing like different things. They don't make the theoretical connections between them. And this creates a lot of friction when you are actually developing tools to implement this in the real world. And as you know, geometric algebra can kind of like unify all of this using the same geometric calculus for any kind of algebra. So starting from here, I decided to 
generalize the theory of adaptive futuring for geometric algebra. As I said, it was, uh, th there are many publications with complex adaptive futures since the 80s and Quaternion's adaptive futures uh, in the 90s, but they didn't make the theoretical connections. So let me explain to you what an adaptive future is. You can think of an ad adaptive future as if it was one neuron in, in a neural network. It is an instance of uh, linear estimation that it learns on the spot and then it tries to, it, it does the inference on the spot as well. So if, think of a FIR future for those who know the, uh, the concepts in signal processing, you are just kind of adapting those coefficients in order to obtain something that uh, can perform linear estimation on the spot. So they are very easy to use computationally inexpensive. So you will see this in many devices today, like noise canceling headphones, aerospace, guidance systems, like they are very useful. And one of the main, uh, one of the nicest characteristics that uh, compared to common filters, which are also very popular, you do not need to uh, assume which statistical distribution you are working with. You just throw stuff into it and it will find its way. Uh, so in my work, I was focused on two main applications. I would like to expand the theory to cover uh, several use cases uh, for adaptive filters using geometric algebras, using complex quaternions and whatever subalgebra you, you may think of. And I also would like to use geometric algebra to make a new family of adaptive filters to apply in a specific problem in robotics that's called the registration problem. The registration problem is something like, if you take a picture of this room using a LiDAR camera and I'm a robot and I want to localize myself inside this, this room, I'm always trying to figure out uh, doing this matching, like I take a picture here and then I look and compare against the map that already pre-exists. So this is the registration problem. I'm, tr I'm always trying to match what I'm seeing and a map that already exists. And previously, nobody could use adaptive filters for this. So, okay, here we go. This is kind of the, the mathematical inception for my PhD. So what I devised here was like a general cost function that uh, uh, highlights the canonical form for a linear transformation applied to a multivector X. So from this general cost function, I can derive the two use case I'm interested in. First of all, on the left, this is the uh, cost function for the standard geometric algebra adaptive filters. So this is something that everybody in signal processing knows, but here now I'm able to use any kind of algebra. It doesn't matter if it's complex quaternions, whatever. It's with the same exact cost function and the same exact calculus, you can solve it for any kind of algebra. This was one half of my PhD, which was more like the, the theoretical part. And then on the right, this is the adaptation for the six degrees of freedom pose estimation, which is the problem that we are solving when we are doing registration. So I'm basically trying to, as I said before, to match two things in space, in a 3D space. I'm gonna give you a visualization uh, of this in, in a minute. So if we start with the left-hand side, why this is nice. So in signal processing, people have been trying to do joint estimation for a while. So imagine that we are observing a physical system. Let's say that uh, it is an airplane moving and then with an airplane, you have accelerometers, gyroscopes, pressure sensor, a bunch of things and you are accumulating all this data. Each sensor is acquiring information from the same phenomenon, but in a different way. Accelerometer will measure uh, acceleration, gyroscopes will measure your gyro. So every time when you're doing this kind of stuff, pressure will measure pressure. 
Those are different, different things, but they are part of the same exact physical phenomenon. So how can you take advantage of all of those things together to perform linear estimation? So one example that I used in my PhD and it's highlighted in this paper here in the IEEE signal processing transactions is if I have this airplane, I, use, I actually use the data set from NASA uh, they provide this data set with a bunch of sensors that were, uh, that were collecting data in an airplane flying through a hurricane. It's a tropical storm. So it's very choppy, like it's very interesting data. So what I was trying to do is, can I predict where this airplane is going to be at some point in the future, future by doing joint estimation of accelerometers, gyroscopes, pressure sensor, everything? <laughs> So previous to this, people would use adaptive filters, but they would uh, devise one adaptive filter for each sensor. And then at the end, they would combine the output and give the estimation. The estimation. Obviously, maybe not obviously, but if you think about this, the final estimation is not that good because you're just, you are assuming that it's coming from different sensors and it, that they don't have any relationship between them. But here we know that there is a relationship between them. They are actually measuring the same physical phenomenon. So what if I could allocate each one of those sensors in a coefficient of a multi-vector? It, it doesn't matter which algebra you choose. In this case, I was working with uh, seven different signals. So I was, I was working with the algebra of the uh, R3. But it doesn't matter, like you could have 100 sensors. Can you take advantage of the natural correlation between those signals by using, by formulating your problem as if it was the estimation of a multi-vector? So what I showed in my paper is that you can actually do this. It's actually very good to do, to do joint estimation. So yeah, so I could go through all the mathematical details, but it's gonna take a long time, but the highlights are, I was able to improve the tracking and prediction of those multidimensional dynamic systems. I also improved the fusion of the data because if you, for those who know signal processing, you know that the fusion data is something that you do always beforehand. You spend a lot of time doing this, this data uh, treatment before you do some sort of estimation. And most importantly, uh, with this kind of setup, I was able to increase the robustness to data noise. So one thing that estimation systems, including Kalman filters and adaptive filters suffer from is if you have noise, it will diverge. And if it diverges, it's really hard to go back to, to track, to, to go back to, to tracking the, the actual uh, progression of the signals. So by doing this joint estimation of several different sensors, you are able to reduce the susceptibility to noise. Right, so that was the extension. There was one application of the extension of adaptive filters from real, from, from the real world to the Clifford algebra world. Now, this is another application here. I'm talking about pose estimation. Again, the registration. How do I understand the 3D world? How do, how do I teach a robot that this is a 3D space and he's located here? So there are many different algorithms coming from robotics to do this. The two most famous ones are the ICP, iterative closest point, and RENZAC. So those algorithms are great, but they are very, very heavy. So now imagine that you are, you, you want to put this in a drone that has limited operation because of battery. So you cannot consume a lot of power. How do you deploy an algorithm such as ICP or RENZAC, which are very, very heavy in such devices? I mean, you can, but your battery is gonna last two minutes. So when I arrived in Munich, they had exactly this problem. They had a robot that needed to navigate a huge indoor space where you cannot use GPS. So everything is vision-based and they needed to deploy a navigation system inside this robot. 
So what I did was to say, okay, let's get rid of all the traditional algorithms such as ICP and RENSEC, and let's put an adaptive filter using geometric algebra to do this. So why geometric algebra here? Because with geometric algebra, I was able to do uh, operations in 3D vectors. I was able to estimate jointly rotation and translation. And that's exactly what we do several times per second. We are trying to figure out where we are by doing translation and rotation. And if you put an adaptive filter that's capable of, uh, that was built on top of geometric algebra to do this in a pipeline, you get a lot of benefits. So one that I showcase you in this figure is the uh, resistance to outliers. So in this kind of problems, when you are taking pictures with a LIDAR, you, you get a lot of noisy data. Like the farther the object is from the camera, the noisier it is. So you get the final thing, like it, it's very difficult to work with that data. So you naturally will have a lot of noise. So how can you still do your job, still do the estimation with this noisy data? So adaptive filters are very good for this. But at the same time, the geometric algebra allows us to perform all of these things with a, the geometric algebra endows the adaptive filters with the geometric notion, which is something that they do not have naturally. Um, as you might remember in this conference, there is a, well, the paper that won, one of the papers that won the best uh, work in the conference is actually building on top of this paper that I'm showing you here. And uh, this is actually something that makes me very happy that actually somebody pick this up and is doing is improving on top of it. So using geometric algebra to, to make something that's uh, very useful for robotics. So this was the second half of my PhD. And then I published a lot of stuff using this with the, the group in Munich. And uh, we did a lot of things that ended up also not being published. So I still have stuff uh, uh, with different algebras using motor algebras and conformal algebras for adaptive, adaptive filters that I never really published. But um, that's something that I would like to pick up again. Uh, unfortunately, with my since I made the transition from academia to, to the industry, I kind of like couldn't, I didn't have enough time to work on this. So I still maintain this website called openga.org, but there's nothing new there for years now, but it still has the, all the algorithms and all the code that I published during my PhD. All right, so now switching gears into geometric algebra neural networks. So when I left academia around 2016, I went to France, I started working with different things. Uh, I, I wasn't working with robotics anymore. I was working with high performance computing. So the basic problem that I had, uh, it was uh, related to, to CERN, the particle accelerator. So as you know, they produce a lot of data in those collisions of particles there. So they need smart methods to collect the data and send this data to their servers to be analyzed. So my job there was to invent some sort of data allocation tool to quickly decide which part, uh, to, to where this would be uh, allocated. They had like FPGAs, they had CPUs, they had GPUs. And depending on what we call quality of service, we needed to uh, uh, provide this to the scientists and enable them to save the, the data they were producing. So, at the time, I made some uh, adaptive filters using geometric algebras to do exactly that. But then things started to get like more intricate. I was really interested in classical machine learning, like random forces and all those things. And then I was started asking myself, how can we bring this into the machine learning world? And as you know, uh, there has been like a lot of interest in innovation in this area since 2012, when machine learning, especially deep learning, came back to life. So a lot of companies today, 
and also universities are focusing on heterogeneous computation, which means that you want to specialize the way you do computation in hardware. So people are moving away from traditional CPUs and GPUs and making specific chips or accelerators for deep learning. So there is a lot of money there. There is a lot of innovation there, but I was always asking myself, what if we could innovate from the mathematical point of view? Because that was something that they were taking for granted, especially people who are the, the purest in deep learning. They, they, it's, it's hard, like they, they're trying to scale what they already have and make this uh, faster with the accelerators. So I started to ask, to ask myself about how, G, how GA could help the performance of a neural network. In this process, I found some stuff that uh, were very interesting. Actually, there is a, a PhD dissertation from 2005 by Sven Buchholz, who unfortunately is not here, he is the first person that I know of that actually conceptualized a neural network system based on Clifford algebras in 2005. And it's amazing, like uh, we, when you read his thesis. And um, when I found that, I, I started to ask myself, well, okay, so how can I bring this to the modern deep learning today. So I decided to try to hack into things such as TensorFlow and PyTorch and try to put the code that I already had into those tools. Well, that's almost an impossible job. TensorFlow and PyTorch are very complicated tools, but I finally managed to make something that was I mean, that it was at least a demo that worked and I could show to people. So what I was doing basically was taking a regular neural network that whose weights are real value numbers and uh, translating them into multi-vectors. So th this was the basic idea. Weights are now multi-vectors. And with regards to the input data set, in this case, I was focusing a lot on uh, computer vision. I was allocating the pixels into multi-vectors as well. And this is more or less what I already spoke about in my first talk or, uh, about the paper on lymphoblasts a few days ago. So again, like I was continuing like thinking, okay, GA can help us innovate in machine learning because of these characteristics such as parameterization of geometric transformations, representation, because now we have the geometric product. And with this, we can redefine or reformulate the whole back propagation algorithm now in Clifford algebra world. Cross correlation, because we can use the cross correlation between the blades for learning and also to uh, enable us to do better analysis. So how do I do this? So at the time, this was 2016, 2017, there was no uh, mainstream uh, GA library that I could plug into TensorFlow and PyTorch. So I started doing this in C++ and Python. So what I basically have today is something that can work as a backend for any one of those tools. And then you can call this with one common line and design neural networks using this. So in my company, we were successful doing this, uh, selling this as a product for people who were developing uh, deep learning in the industry. And finally, this is just to show you one of the benefits that this can bring, that uh, this, this is like a, a neural network, it's a very simple neural network, but just to show you what is possible when you do this with Clifford algebra. So the blue curve, represents the several different ways, uh, several different uh, accuracies for different size of neural networks. So basically what we take from this chart is that with a Clifford algebra neural network, I can learn as much as a traditional TensorFlow neural network, same architecture, but using 90% less parameters in this case. So it's a very, very compact neural network. 
that enables you to deploy in low power devices. And that's what we are focusing on in my company. But if you're really prioritizing accuracy, you can actually, if you are in this region of parameters, which in this case, 20 million parameters, you can have more accuracy than the traditional TensorFlow neural network. Is this the exact same architecture I'm just using? In this case, I believe it's quaternions. So this sort of effects are very interesting, especially if you are in the industry. In the industry, you don't have time to you know, do research in order to optimize your model that much. So only by changing the algebra, you are able to offer more performance, either in terms of less parameters, which will result in low power device or low power algorithms, or in terms of accuracy. So just very quickly to show you this industrial application for this car manufacturer, when we sold the product to them, they had this problem of, uh, they were trying to do visual inspection in the assembly line to basically see if the pieces were going in the right place in the car or if there were some damage. And for them, it was very hard to do this with the classical deep learning that they had in there. It's like the accuracy was very, very low. And then when we did this, when we sold the product to them and they trained using our engine, they were able to increase in 37% the accuracy that they were having. So they were very happy with this. And again, that's a real life contribution of geometric algebra to the world of deep learning. So I leave here some, there are some uh, publications here. So people continue to be very interested uh, in this, in the deep learning community. Uh, yeah, so if you want to talk more about this, I'm happy to connect. Yeah, so I reached the end, thank you. So in your, uh neural net at the end you do the cost function is that your least squares that you apply in the tensor flow or is it for the neural net what we've done was to adapt all the optimizers that are already included in those packages so for example the adam optimizer so we just went inside the program and modified that eventually we made our own in our own uh, 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 engine but it's not theoretically different from the add-in. It's just adapted to understand and operate in the world of Clifford algebra. So the, the graph you showed was with tensor flows, least squares, or? Uh, this is with tensor flow, but operating in, uh, in, with geometric calculus. And you said cross-correlation. Do you use other uh, cost functions there, like Oh, no, yeah. For this example, this, this is just a, what we call the log evidence cost function. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we have all of them, basically. All, all, of, all, all of the functions and optimizers that you have inside TensorFlow are supported by this engine. Okay, and then one more. Uh, so you use this in a least square sense, which is known to be more sensitive to outliers than other optimizers. Right. Have you looked at it with other optimizers? Right, right. Especially in the case of uh, adaptive filters in you know, recursive list squares. And there is, my master's was about the combination of uh, adaptive filters. So I do have this in my thesis. I didn't show here, but I, I designed it the same uh, recursive list squares filter using geometric algebra. Thanks, Wilder. I'm going to ask the same question you were asked after the Monday talk. Can you say a little bit about the activation functions you're using? Right. Yeah, I didn't put it in here. Activation functions. This is a huge discussion in the deep learning community. The one that we've been using the most is the one we call, which is the split activation. So imagine that you have a ReLU, which is the most common today. Now apply the ReLU individually to each blade. That's what the split activation is. This works very well. It's not ideal though, because it's not a multivector per se. You're not applying this to the multivector. There are other uh, functions such as a swish that we've done some research internally and it works well for a few applications. So you apply the full switch, uh, swish uh, activation function to the multivector, and then you obtain a multivector at the end. So for this, uh, in in some settings for uh, 
image classification, it works very well. So, I mean, it's a, it can be a very long answer. This is a research topic and there is a lot to be done still. Yeah, I agree. I, split activation seems disappointing. Yeah, it's, it's disappointing that it works so well. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks, Will Dirth, Joan Lazenby. Um, if I go, go back to the general linear estimation and the, your nice angle of attack mm -hmm. um, graph. Now, suppose I set up a nice, Kalman filter, extended Kalman filter, say, mm -hmm. you know, I could have my state with all the, the um, inputs, mm -hmm. I could form my covariances carefully. Mm -hmm. So is your, is your method still better than me doing that? I didn't do this test, but I think it will be equivalent because this method is very good for non-stationary scenarios. So this is something I've been interested in since my master's. My master's was about like how to, to make adaptive filters to operate in non-stationary scenarios, which are very challenging. And this one is obviously a non-stationary scenario. Yeah. So I didn't do the test, but I believe it would be the same. I don't think it would have more advantages than a common filter. I mean, it would be interesting because setting up an EKF Mm. is yes it's, is pretty it, it, complex yeah. you know you've got to get everything right your covariances if they're not right they mess it up right so if th this is much easier i think much more simple to set up mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it'd be interesting to see that right and there is a theoretical result from signal processing where you can recover an eks from an adaptive future i can show you this uh, so in, this is all to say that you don't need common futures I love Kalman filters. Everyone loves Kalman filters. Oh. I really like Kalman filters, but there are better things. I mean, adaptive filters can really solve a, a lot of stuff. Thank you. There is uh, Eric. Great talk. Thank you. This is Eric Wieser. Um, you said that you couldn't find any implementations of GA for TensorFlow when you were looking at this, uh, but in 2020, Robin Carlo made TFGA. Have you had a chance to look at that? This was 2020, but I started doing this in 2017. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> have you had a chance to compare your library with his library? I didn't have a chance, okay, but I did fine. play. I did play with it. Yeah. I mean, just not doing anything serious. Sure. Great. Thank you. <laughs> 